You made your first money inventing video games, Richard, and you're still young at heart. When and how did your dreams of going to space start? For me, the journey to space began when I was quite young. Uh, as I think you may know, my father was a NASA astronaut, and, and so I grew up around an astronaut, and both my left and right hand next door neighbors were astronauts. Over my back fence were a few more astronauts, so I grew up in a neighborhood where I believed that everyone was going to go to space, because everyone I know did. But uh, for me, the decision to want to go into space came when a NASA doctor told me that my poor eyesight would prevent me from being able to travel into space. And as a kid, as opposed to giving up on the possibility of going to space, that's actually what uh, solidified the dream in me that someday I'm going to go to space. But if I can't go with NASA, I'm going to have to uh, create a private space industry uh, to allow myself to go. And so while my career has been in making computer games, which is where, where I've earned my money, I have spent all my money in the privatization of space so that uh, I could create an environment to go myself. And your father must have been the hero of your childhood. Have you still a good relationship to him? Is he feeling well? My father and I actually have a far better and stronger relationship now than we did when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, when I was young, my father would, of course, work hard at NASA, and when he came home, would often work hard in his study associated with the activities of, of space flight. Um, so for my space trip, I, the first person I called was my father to see if he would become my chief scientist to help me arrange my science uh, program for my flight. And so we've actually worked together very closely uh, throughout my flight and even still to this day. He must be very proud of you. How long before you went in 2008, how long did you have to prepare yourself physically for that trip? Well, the, uh, uh, I knew that I would be flying into space about two years uh, prior to the actual flight. And the first year before flight was spent uh, mostly in uh, medical pre-qualification. So um, uh, not only did I get myself physically in as good a shape as I could, uh, but uh, also I had lots of medical tests that I had to undergo. Uh, and uh, uh, you, know, if you, are, you know, if you try to become a NASA astronaut, if you are medically imperfect, they will pass on you and go to someone else. If you're paying your own way to go into space, they, if you're medically imperfect, they want you to survive the trip to space. And so, uh, uh, so, so they, they make you become medically perfect. So in my case, I actually had to have a, uh, uh, had to undergo major surgery that uh, first year in order to uh, remove a piece of my liver that was uh, malformed before they would allow me to fly into space. What could have happened to your liver? So on space? my liver, the, I had something called a hemangioma. Uh, normal, a normal liver uh, has uh, six arteries feeding it and six veins draining it. Uh, and each of those six sections is called a lobe. And in my case, I had six uh, arteries, but only five veins. And so one lobe of my liver was overpressured. And it's possible that in, in space, if there was a depressurization of the spacecraft, it could cause internal bleeding, which would be uh, difficult to diagnose and impossible to fix and potentially, therefore, fatal. And so uh, in my case, it made me remove it. You showed us a big scar at lunch. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. So, uh, uh, and so I did. So I've, uh, and, and so this is kind of my, my memento of yes. my uh, of my trip to space. Is to uh, this will stay with me always as as uh, you know my uh, my memory uh, of my space flight. It was worth it, wasn't it? Absolutely. So, by the way, this this level of surgery is not easy. Uh, you know, I spent uh, a week or more in the hospital. And it is considered, uh, you know, a major surgery, so potentially dangerous. Uh, but um, it was just one more of the hurdles that was required to reach space. What about your eyes? Did you take glasses into space? Interesting thing about my eyes is that uh, uh, years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, I had laser eye surgery uh, when it was first developed uh, to correct my vision. And so, no, I did not need any glasses in space. But more interestingly is that this same condition that years ago NASA told me would prevent me from going into space is 
also a condition the, that NASA was very interested in studying about me when I did go to space. And so one of the major experiments uh, that I was involved in, or one of the main experiments, was to study my uh, eyesight while I was in space. Because uh, NASA has only just this last year approved the same surgery for astronaut candidates. But no astronaut has flown in space, no astronaut has been even hired who has had uh, corrective eye surgery. So I was the first test case. Uh, and nothing happened, so no yes, bleeding, no problems? No problems, but, uh, uh, but there's reason to believe that there could have been problems because uh, while you're in space, the pressure on the inside of your eye goes up by about 20 to 50 percent, as mine did also. Um, and since after laser eye surgery, your, your, your cornea has been thinned, and so it's, you would think that it's possible with the increase in pressure that that might deform or change your uh, vision capabilities. And in my case, uh, I did have the pressure change, but had no visual change. And you weren't afraid that the whole vision could get lost by that high pressure? That the nerve for <coughs> looking, for seeing? Well, the, uh, uh, the, this, I the issue of visual acuity change with uh, eye pressure change has been studied already to some degree. But I'm the first person who has had a thinned cornea. So uh, they believed, and I believed, it would not be a problem. But uh, I was the test case to demonstrate that it's true, that there would not be a problem. You did medical tests on yourself. You did this nice DHL test with the looping, currently looping. And you showed me that you had you brought art into space, and you made art experiments, painting in space, mm -hmm. and smashing colors on mm -hmm. white papers. What else did you do for research? Yeah. So I had a very full program of uh, you know what I would consider uh, scientific research, also uh, commercial uh, activities. Uh, as well as educational outreach as well. So uh, for scientific research, I did something called protein crystal growth. Uh, I did uh, eight medical experiments. Um, for commercial activities, I worked with uh, Seiko, the watchmaker, DHL, the shipping company, to do, uh, you know, both uh, DHL's experiment was educational rela educationally related. Uh, Seiko's experiment was the first time they've flown a very new type of watch. Uh, it's actually this watch, this Spring Drive spacewalk, was made for outer space, and it's the, I was the first uh, person to take it into space. Um, for educational activities, I worked with uh, uh, the Challenger Learning Centers. It's a global uh, set of centers for uh, children's education in the areas of space science, uh, as well as uh, groups like the British National Space Center uh, to, again, do educational outreach, uh, both uh, the United States and the UK and globally. So I really had quite a, quite a full uh, list of activities on the serious side, plus, as you mentioned, my fun things like uh, not only to create art in space and do an art show in space, uh, but I also filmed the very first ever science fiction movie ever made in space and an entire magic show in space. That sounds beautiful and interesting and we found out, we find out where we get this <laughs> to, yeah. to take a look at it. Um, to your living with zero G, um, you're a fan of these change. I always see them, see you with them and uh, I see that even in space you never lose your snake. Well, well, this particular uh, emblem, or you know, uh, medallion, for me has uh, has special meaning. Uh, my father is a NASA astronaut. My mother is an artist. My career is in computer games, which is high tech art. And this is a piece of art that I made uh, that my mother showed me or taught me how to make when I was only 11 years old, and it's actually permanently attached to my neck. There's actually no way; it's not possible for me to take it off. And so the only times this has been off of my neck was I sent it into space with my father on the uh, space shuttle. And of course, therefore, I also took it with me into space. So even though this was my first trip into space, uh, it, was, uh, it was this uh, medallion's second trip into space. Isn't that a little bit uncomfortable? Because we saw in the movie that it's always swaying around your neck. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I didn't. I've never noticed uh, it moving in space. It is funny, though, that uh, while I didn't notice the medallion, uh, you have noticed uh, my braids. And what's interesting about microgravity is that you know here on the ground, in one gravity, uh, gravity pulls these braids down towards the floor. But in space, everything takes its natural uh, shape. 
And unfortunately for me, the natural shape of these braids was right like this. And so in all of the videos I tried to make for uh, educational videos or talking to uh, people for various purposes, I constantly had my, my, uh, my braids uh, coming here in front of me. Uh, and so it uh, interfered with my work. These interfered with my work, but the chain did not. And looked like a mustache. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We um, think about the problems you have with uh, zero G. How do you eat, for example, and how do you wash yourself, or do you go to the bathroom? How mm. does it work? Uh, yes, life, uh, life in space is, uh, you know, ha has some interesting challenges because of microgravity. Uh, some of them are fairly easily overcome. For example, uh, eating and drinking in space is fairly straightforward. You know, you uh, obviously can't pour a, a drink into a glass because it would all the fluid would escape. Um, so instead, you drink everything out of uh, plastic bags with straws, um, and that's actually a perfectly fine way to drink. Uh, eating is also solvable, not quite as pleasant as eating here on the ground. It tends to be out of uh, either out of bags or cans that when you open the lid on the can, the food is moist, and the moisture will help uh, the pieces of food cling to each other. And so if you just open, to say, a bag of candy or potato chips, uh, all of it would just float away. But if, you're, if you open a can of something that looks like uh, dog food, uh, you know, it, it will stay together in the can, and so you can dig it out with a spoon or a fork and eat it. It's not as pleasant as eating on the ground, but quite solvable. Um, but there are more interesting problems like uh, washing and uh, using the bathroom. Uh, you know, washing, you can't really take a shower or r have running water for brushing your teeth or anything because the, the water will just freely float around. And so instead, people tend to use just damp towels uh, to wash their face and their body and their hair. Uh, and so it's, not, it's also not quite as fulfilling, you might say, as, uh, as a good shower you know, here uh, on the earth. That was actually one of the things I looked forward to the most is getting home and taking a shower. Okay. Um, and the toilet facilities are also uh, very challenging. And what I find interesting about using the bathroom in space is that it's not only the most common question children ask astronauts, but I can tell you it's also the most common question that astronauts and cosmonauts discuss with each other before flight. Uh, because everyone who's go flying for their first time really wants to know the details because there's no way to practice here on the ground. Everyone, is, everyone becomes trained on how the toilet operates, but you can't really test uh, the process here on the ground. And I can tell you, having now flown in space, that the answer you hear most every astronaut give you and the answer that's even in books that have been written, there's books you can buy titled How to Go to the Bathroom in Space. <laughs> All those descriptions are incomplete. The actual problem of going to the bathroom in space is uh, more complicated, more challenging than most people are uh, willing to discuss uh, publicly because okay. it's embarrassing. <laughs> but you, you don't. Okay, so you said there are embarrassing problems you encounter. Um. Yes, so uh, uh, using the bathroom is an interesting challenge. You know, normally you would think that there's two types of challenge, you know, liquid waste disposal and solid waste disposal. Well, liquid waste disposal is really not too much of a problem for men or for women. You basically urinate into a vacuum cleaner is the metaphor that is the closest thing to be accurate. And there's a funnel. Uh, that's, uh, you know, they have a special funnel for women, but otherwise it's still uh, just a funnel that you urinate into and it's not really much of a, much of a problem. Solid waste disposal is a much bigger problem. Um, the theory is, the way the, the toilet works, is they have a small toilet seat that's about the size of a shoebox. Uh, inside there is a plastic bag uh, that is an insert that is about the size of a Coke can. And there's perforations in the bottom of it so that airflow will go down through that bag. It, the theory being to take any solid wastes into the bag, the bag will contain them. Uh, and that toilet seat is sitting on top of an aluminum uh, container to which the same vacuum is attached to uh, that keeps this airflow going in through the bag. And the top of the bag has a rubber band on it so that when you're, when you're finished, you can remove the rubber band and the, the whole bag will fall into this container. And when the container is full, you will throw it away and put a new container in. So that's the theory. Here's the problem. And I will use a metaphor of toothpaste to describe the issue in hand. 
Here, here, for example, in this hotel or in your room, if you were to squeeze toothpaste out of a tube, gravity would pull some fraction, you know, when you get a, enough toothpaste out, gravity will pull that toothpaste away from the tube into the sink, for example. In space, however, if you do the same experiment, you would get a longer and longer and longer and longer and longer bit of toothpaste. No gravity. It would never separate. And if you tried to pull the, t the, the tube away, it will pull the stream of toothpaste with it. And so if you now were to do this same experiment into the plastic bag, you, oh, and there's one more important piece of data that's that you need to know, which is that uh, uh, on the ground, when you are physically active, that helps food move through your digestion system. So in space, your whole uh, gastrointestinal tract slows down. And so if you go to the bathroom, say, every day here on, on the ground, you will probably only have to go to the bathroom about once every five days in space. But when you finally do need to go, you really need to go. Okay? So now we go back to the experiment. You now have, you're, you're creating a, 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 a length of toothpaste that becomes about as long as a Coke can is deep. And now you've reached the bottom of the bag. And you're still not ready. And you're not finished. So what do you do? And this has never been discussed before you arrive in space. And what's funny is you, you then have to figure out what your next plan is. And it turns out most everyone figures out the same thing. Because I've discussed this afterwards with even my father, who has described, oh, yes, that's the solution everyone comes up with, which is you basically bounce to create uh, artificial uh, you know, inertia yeah. uh, to separate yourself from these parts. But then you have additional problems in that now the plastic bag has obstructions in it. And so it turns out that the, the total process of figuring out how to get the solids out of you and all into this small plastic bag is a very lengthy process. It takes about 45 minutes the first time and pretty much any time you do it. And, uh, you know, and requires you know, great care because of the structure of the toilet. And so if I were redesigning the space station, you know, one of the, you know, the, I know there have been many space toilets invented, uh, and this, this particular toilet is still considered the best toilet so far, uh, but uh, uh, it still leaves uh, a lot to be desired compared to the convenience of a modern toilet here on, in gravity. When you bounce, you may not bounce too high because then the stuff comes up again. No, no, yes, you have to be yeah. very careful or you can yeah. make a big mess because, as you probably know, uh, you know, liquid waste, human, liquid human waste is sterile and not dangerous, um, but solid waste is actually a biological hazard. And so uh, proper use of the toilet and making sure that it, you really complete the process in a sanitary way is actually extremely important when you're in a closed environment like the space station. It could be quite dangerous to crew health uh, if it's not done correctly. We had that problem, didn't we, in one of the last missions? I heard in German TV that uh, the toilet was kind of broken. They've actually had a number of, of problems. The Just before my flight, in fact, within a month of my flight, the toilet actually completely broke and was not usable. And so they had to go to the backups, which is to use the toilets on board the Soyuz vehicles, which is a much worse toilet. And so uh, you, uh, you went, go from a difficult situation to an extremely difficult and situation. Uh, so having an operational toilet is very important. But they've also had what I'll call accidents, uh, where people have uh, you know, misused the toilet and you know, operationally. And, uh, and that has required, uh, you know, a cleanup, you might say, that's been complicated and, um, you know, a nuisance. Hmm, I understand. This is, uh, if I had anybody who should learn about space life, you would be a very good teacher for that. Are you teaching yeah. now? You, you teach in radio? That's what I learned. Uh, well, what I'm doing now is my life since my flight uh, has been traveling and speaking about uh, space. And uh, not only my experience, but some of the things I think I've, I've learned and, and come away with, uh, not only based on you know, just the experience itself, uh, but also things that you, uh, uh, impressions that I have of, j of just looking back at the Earth. For example, um, I had always heard before my trip that seeing the Earth from space will change you as a person. But I was honestly skeptical that that would be true for me. 
mainly because I've already done so many what I would think of as amazing things. I mean, I've been down to the Titanic and I've been to Antarctica and many other, you know, um, you know every continent of the earth and safaris and you know, all sorts of things. And, uh, and so I expected to space to be amazing, but not necessarily life-changing. And when you finally do reach space, the view from sp the, even the first view from space is amazing, but not life-changing. But what happens is as you see the Earth go by day after day, you, something very important happens to your perception. And I can describe that to you. you know, first, when you see the Earth from space and you see the thin atmosphere and the curvature of the Earth, immediately the Earth begins to feel smaller, or at least finite. You, know, you, you can feel the, the total. And so it has a, a size that you can mentally understand. And as days go by, you begin to first notice what I will call the large-scale systems of the Earth at work. Weather, for example. You get such a great view of, of how weather is formed and interacts that even though I'm not a meteorologist, you have a, a, a better sense of how weather works in the world. As you see more land masses go by, you see how those large-scale systems work, how uh, tectonic plate movement through uh, fractures in the Earth's surface are forming mountains and uh, uh, the shapes that we're now familiar with as the continents. You see so many river systems, and you see all the silt uh, and material being washed from the surface of the continents out into the oceans just on an enormous scale that you can really perceive well from space. Same thing with wind erosion in some of the vast deserts that I've seen. And, uh, the, the erosion by wind is much more vast than I had ever understood prior to seeing the Earth from space. But the most important thing only happens after you've seen the Earth for a few days in a row, or I would say a week at least, which is you notice that all of the fertile parts of the Earth are now fully occupied by humans. They're either cities or farms, but the only sea people is high mountains, vast deserts, certain swampy areas like in the Amazon. But everywhere that's easy to utilize has people fully utilizing it. And even the difficult to exist places now, like deserts, are being terraformed and utilized by people, which you know is putting, it's at least much more expensive than it would be to build in the more fertile places. Um, and it really makes you wonder about the pressure of this footprint of humanity on the Earth. And so since my flight, it's made me want to do more research as to, to really understand not just the subjective impression you get from looking from space, but the objective data, the scientific data, you know, it made me wonder, does the scientific data back up my impression from space? And the answer is yes, that it does. And, you know, that's not necessarily surprising. I already considered myself an environmentalist before I went on this trip, but the importance that now this impression has put on what I do with my life going forward is what has really changed. So we're a little bit frightened, but we try to change anything, but we don't know really what. <laughs> well, what's interesting about that is that, you know, I, my impression is not that I think we're at this moment of potential catastrophe, although it's possible we are with things like global warming. Um, but more importantly, the thing I began to notice is that at the very least life uh, the cost of existence here on the earth is going to become more and more ex expensive and and in ways that i mean like food production is going to become ultimate is going to become more expensive because we just are running out of the easy places to grow food t in the volume we need it for the growing population also fresh water we're ultimately going to need to be desalinating ocean water or some other you know creating a fresh water because there's just not going to be enough to go around and just those two ideas, much less if you believe like I do that we should be a spacefaring nation and traveling through the universe, now I've got three ideas on the table, all of those require enormous amounts of energy, which is another major problem on our planet, is where to get energy from. And so it's made me go do research in the areas of energy utilization as well as energy production to think about what are the long-term solutions. Solutions. Do we need, for example, space-based solar power? Um, you know, how, mu how much of an important role is conservation or electric vehicles, for example? And, uh, and I have, you know, in my talks now, I talk about that quite a bit as to what parts I believe those roles can play. And not only, uh, you know, can play for what we call the importance uh, for humanity, but I actually believe it makes 
good business sense. And so I'm even looking at all this, my time in space and these other activities on the ground, not purely as a let's go save the world, uh, you know, uh, uh, point of view, but also is, uh, as I believe these will be great economic engines for the next generation of, uh, of uh, life here on Earth to uh, find a way to, you know, not only save the planet, but just as importantly, find, uh, you know, great and interesting things for us all to do uh, as businesses going forward. Which is really true. Um, did you get another religious aspect when you went <coughs> up there, or you, don't you want to talk about it? Or oh, I'm happy to talk about it. So yeah. I, uh, I would not call myself a religious person, uh, but there is no question that uh, you know, living aboard a space station in an in an environment which is so uh, uh, alien and uh, both removed as well as dangerous, uh, but also with the, the awesome view that's out the window and the awesome perspective that you have about uh, the total impact of humanity on our finite planet is definitely what I would call a spiritually moving event. Um, and, so, uh, uh, and so I would describe it as spiritual in the sense of it really moves you to think about uh, you know, the earth and the entirety of humanity in a very different way that you don't experience uh, prior to flying in space. Thank you very much. I'm deeply impressed with what you told me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>